Okay, so, um, all right, and let me start sharing. Okay, so, um, yeah, I think uh, today we're going to uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, the research reports, uh, reviews, um, and also um, uh, cover particle filters. I'm going to talk a little bit about SLAM, which is um, simultaneous location of mapping. Uh, very um, important topic in robotics, also in autonomous uh, vehicles. Um, and, uh, but Boy, you could spend a whole course on that. And uh, so we're just going to kind of talk about some concepts if this ends up being the type of thing that you'd like to dive deeper into, then um, you know, feel free to pivot your, uh, your project to that or uh, do your research um, reviews on that or, or something like that, right? So, and um, I'm more than happy on any of these topics that we, kind of gloss over, um, more than happy to help uh, point you in the right direction for deeper study. And, um, you know, we're trying to uh, do something, you know, a little different with this course since it's, uh, you know, entirely remote um, synchronous uh, and stuff um, that we, yeah, uh, kind of uh, letting you define the course a little bit uh, for your own purposes um, and, and interest. And um, uh, not quite an independent study, but kind of uh, a little bit along those lines. Uh, but yeah. So, um, all right. So let's, let's uh, then, oh, I'm sorry. Also, uh, the second part of the lecture, we'll uh, start talking about some sensor hardware. I'm going to do a deep dive on millimeter wave uh, linear FM uh, CW uh, radars, and <clears throat> um, uh, and then I'll I'll uh, chat uh, about uh, cameras and sonars and lidars. Um, we'll uh, we can talk more about lidars uh, as we go, but. Uh, because uh, they're they're very important. Cameras are also very important. Um, um, just not not going to dive as as deep into that hardware technology. I actually know radars a lot better, and so uh, I'm going to play to my strengths there. Um, all right. So uh, when uh, I was reviewing, uh, I think I reviewed about ten. I I know that someone had turned theirs in just after. I had downloaded uh, all of them. I didn't realize that until uh, later um, and stuff. So I'll uh, I'll catch up on those. If you haven't turned your abstract in yet, uh, hopefully uh, this will help you uh, to get going. Right. So I'm um, I my go to on doing research is I uh, usually start at scholar.google.com. And uh, there's lots of other things you can look at. Uh, IEEE as a digital library. I'm a member of uh, Communication Society and also um, uh, Aerospace. Uh, and so I get a uh, little bit better access to those uh, publications. Uh, IEEE is not cheap in terms of uh, getting access to um, uh, their libraries, but you know that's where a lot of us have published most of our work. Uh, there's ACM also, um, uh, but um, if you have any difficulty getting any of these, uh, uh, talk to me. We can uh, order these uh, through the library. Uh, so uh, because I triply so expensive, uh, uh, you know, university or college like ours. Um, uh, has to make choices and stuff. So last time I checked, we didn't have a full subscription to them. Uh, I think you can get um, 
either journal articles or not and not conference or vice versa so um but we can order them one off and uh the library will pay for those out of their budget or there might be other ways of uh getting these papers so um so yeah there's uh you know a number of uh different ways of finding uh these things uh you can go the traditional library route uh um but there's uh yeah just lots of top things uh you're probably not well served by a general google bing or DuckDuckGo type search um uh because you're just gonna get massive amounts of non-research articles right so um what i you know intend for this assignment is for you to understand the um uh the present uh state of research in a particular topic and um you know a couple of y'all are uh like looking at policy and regulatory issues ethics issues and that type of thing um that's okay. I mean, we're an engineering course. Um, uh, it, this might be an interesting uh, one to uh, to kind of co-teach with uh, a law school, but Manhattan College doesn't have a law school, and um, uh, we we uh, lose all the lawyers uh, in uh, in all our uh, technology discussions anyway. But um, yeah, if you really want to kind of stay on the policy side and, and all that type of thing, just try to make it somewhat technical, right? So we're not a law school. We're not a, you know, government policy uh, program or, or anything like that. So um, uh, understand and appreciate your interest. I'm just trying to encourage you to, to get a little bit more towards the technical research side of things. And uh, the idea being is that uh, at the end of the course, you should be able to walk into an interview uh, or, um, you know, attend a conference and have uh, significantly deep uh, conversations in your in that area of expertise. You're not going to know everything about autonomous vehicles uh, in one course and reading, uh, uh, you know, five to ten technical papers, but uh, you can uh, gain a real depth of knowledge in one particular area of that. And so that's uh, that's the intention. Um, it's not a research report. It's a review of a selected set of research papers, right? Now, in this process, you're going to read all these papers. And you're going to, um, you know, try to make sense of them. Uh, maybe the first time you you plow through one of these papers, if it's particularly technical, theoretical paper, um, you might find it way over your head. I I do, and uh, I've been at this for forty years, and um, and stuff. But um, uh, that's okay. You know, you're you're uh going to gradually learn uh some of this uh type of um stuff right so uh for example if you're uh you know studying uh some sort of decision making process you might run across markov decision processes and uh i think i've maybe touched on those already in this course or maybe i will we talk about in communication systems also um so it's a very very common uh, uh approach at analyzing uh you know systems sequential systems systems that evolve over time and um uh so it it finds a lot of universal uh applicability um and that may be uh you know something that you run into uh, after reading a few papers, it's like, wow, I keep seeing the same same topic um, and stuff. So you'll eventually begin to understand some of these things. So um, uh, don't don't get you know intimidated away and and frozen in your your process here, right? So this is uh, uh, something that it it's going to take a little critical mass of reading some of these papers 
before everything clicks, right? So, um, all right. So, uh, how can we uh, approach this? So, just you know, super easy. It's uh, to get started. And if you go to uh, this uh, scholar.google.com, and I just uh, typed in segmentation and autonomous vehicles. I did this for uh, reviewing, um, you know, feeding back uh, on uh, someone's uh, uh, assignment. And they weren't totally focused on segmentation, but that's just what I kind of came up with as an example, right? And then I just clicked uh, since 2019. So we get the more recent ones, right? And um, then, uh, uh, you know, you, you're going to get uh, these, right? So here's your uh, bibliographic citation. You can click on cite and uh, it will give you already pre-done these uh, uh, different citations in different formats, right? And you should pick one. Uh, that you're going to use, you know, Chicago or Harvard. Uh, Chicago is a pretty common one. MLA is also. Um, but, uh, you know, I, for formal work, I don't like this a all type of thing, right? So uh, Chicago has everything in there. And uh, you click that and you can just uh, copy and, and uh, paste this and uh, boom, right? So, um, if you're uh, doing research, you may want to look into uh, writing your papers and stuff in LaTeX. Um, it's kind of a, a common standard instead of Word uh, or, or uh, other type of word processing. Um, and uh, BibTeX uh, format gives you things in uh, a kind of a, a database type uh, format and uh, you can save that into uh, a file and then uh, use tools and you can um, uh, keep track of all your references if you're doing a, a thesis or you end up doing a PhD later and doing a dissertation then you're gonna end up reading you know dozens of you know hundreds of uh, papers and um, uh, keeping track of these things in a database along with some of your notes and comments on the papers uh, is, a, is a good idea. So um, then, uh, so we can, uh, like this one uh, here at GridNet, uh, GroundNet, uh, fast ground plane estimation point count segmentation for autonomous vehicles, right? So that sounds nice, nice meaty technical uh, paper there, right? So if we go here, uh, uh, we're going to get directed to the IEEE uh, um, digital library uh, site. And uh, you can, um, uh, might, uh, if you log in or do this from the uh, library or something, you might have access to this, but probably not because it's from a, a conference, right? And, um, <clears throat> but uh, again, you're gonna have uh, uh, citation information here and uh, uh, stuff, but mostly you have this abstract, right? And you can read this abstract and um, decide, hey, is this interesting? Is it relevant to me? Uh, actually, in a lot of cases, uh, Google Scholar uh, puts out here um, kind of uh, full text uh, opportunities. Not doesn't always work, um, uh, but this one's taking us to Hal uh, Science, and um, uh, so here's a uh, um, uh, access to this paper, right? So um, sometimes you can you can find these even uh, not necessarily right from uh, the source. And, and what's happening is a lot of uh, authors publish their work on their you know websites, right? So these guys were with uh, in in Ria, um, and so they're publishing this paper on their um, their archive and stuff so um all right and um uh so you can kind of pick through these and uh some of these aren't necessarily going to be um perfect like uh 
here's a segmentation analysis across six countries. Well, this is more of a kind of policy and business type of research paper. Uh, it's not uh, computer vision segmentation. It's um, kind of segmenting between sectors or whatever, right? So, uh, you know, here's uh, uh, just uh, another type of thing where their segment is showing up but because it's kind of a common name it doesn't necessarily uh, uh, apply directly all right so uh, another example improving range and millimeter wave uh, FMCW radar right so you can even put in some abbreviations in here uh, FMCW stands for frequency modulate continuous wave uh, radar and stuff so again selecting a, a, a date range and uh, here you're going to see a number of papers uh, here's one uh, high isolation antenna uh, array antenna integration for single chip millimeter wave FMCW. So if you're a hardware guy, especially if you're an RF guy or sensor guy, gal, uh, want to work uh, towards the physics end of engineering, um, then yeah, this would be a great topic for you. And uh, so um, yeah, um, this this would be a nice meaty technical paper. It looks like they've done uh, some work here and um, has some some results uh we'll talk about that in a minute on things to look for right so here's another paper uh from that same search uh it's more of a survey right so um uh these guys may have been uh um like you know it's it's common for someone that's kind of early in their let's say phd program to put together a survey. Uh, sometimes experts in the field do this also. Um, and uh, every you know few years, a survey is kind of warranted in a particular field, kind of update things. Uh, and they'll uh, review lots of different papers. So uh, I haven't actually looked at this, but uh, typically, <laughs> You come down here and you're going to see yeah, 155 different references because that's the purpose of the paper. They may introduce some of their own new theory, um, which is you know common but not necessary in a survey. A survey is literally looking at uh, other people's papers and trying to review them and uh, kind of organize them and and help others uh, be able to kind of jumpstart their research and get a good understanding of the state of the art and where it's heading um, and all. So um, here's, uh, here's another one. This is uh, from a, a journal article. And this is now uh, looking at um, uh, doing target classification. So it's still with FMCW radars, but it's using machine learning. Right. And uh, uh, so uh, this one is like on uh, building antenna arrays, right, on, on a substrate. And uh, this is machine learning. So even though they're both with FMCW radars, they're very, very different. Right. So um, you're the, you know, to, uh, you know, I'm going to give everyone a lot of latitude on this assignment, but to really, um, uh, you know, do what I'm intending you to do, you're going to um, like narrow your focus even more, not just on FMCWs, but you're going to look at maybe MIMO antenna arrays um, or, um, you know, the uh, there's a, a local oscillator uh, chirp type uh, uh, generator here. Uh, or you may look at how, how do we scale these things up for higher range, uh, longer longer distance, or uh, that type of thing, right? So you may be interested in um, that type of uh, type of thing. But really, a, a big challenge in these and trying to take them from um, uh, to to real imaging level type sensors is integrating many antennas onto them. And when you do that, you've got this like isolation issue uh, between, um, uh, and there's mutual 
uh, conductance, mutual interference between all these different array elements and stuff, and uh, the transmitter leaking into the receiver uh, and overloading it and that type of thing. So, um, all right. So, um, let me. Uh, I'm going to share this presentation, which is. Um, uh, I don't know, Nitin, uh, uh, this guy, or uh, I think that's a, a guy's name. Um, uh, don't know this person, uh, but my PhD advisor shared this with uh, our, her research group, uh, including me. And um, uh, so I just kind of passed it on. Maybe someday I'll write one of my own. Uh, so, yeah, he's got some caveats in here. Um, just, just some advice here, right? So... Um, and, uh, so I just posted this, uh, yesterday, I think on this week's, uh, Moodle section. Um, so, uh, yeah, why do we read research papers, right? Well, you might not end up in research in your career and that's fine. Uh, but you know, uh, uh, you likely want to stay up with what's happening in the field, right? And, um, you know, you don't uh, uh, want to do a bunch of work that's already been done, right? And uh, just uh, stand on the shoulders of giants instead of trying to reinvent everything yourself. And uh, yeah, if you are planning to do some of your own research, it, it kind of helps uh, guide you on uh, what might be an interesting topic. Um, but yeah, why not to read papers? Well, you got to draw a line somewhere. Right, you can't read everything. Eventually, you gotta actually do some work. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there you probably should avoid. Uh, maybe it's just not that high quality, or maybe it's just distracting and uh, and stuff. So uh, it's just like a ton of noise. Uh, but also, um, if you are, are constantly um, looking at uh, everyone else's solutions before you've really thought about uh, the solutions yourself, uh, you're going to get biased and a little tunnel vision, right? So, um, and as I say, a lot of solutions uh, kind of follow a particular theme. There's a bit of a herd mentality. Once one person's done some, uh, you know, applied game theory, then everyone wants to apply game theory to that problem or, or uh, someone's uh, used uh, transformers in uh, machine learning, then everyone's going to, you know, use that same tool. And uh, so, um, um, yeah, that's the, a whole a whole nother topic on creativity and innovation uh, we could spend hours uh, talking about, right? But uh, so what do you do? You read, of course, but know what's important, know what can be ignored without significant loss of information. And that's partly how we approach uh papers right so um um uh, so what uh what to read right so i've already kind of pointed you in a direction of reading research papers not just like articles out of trade magazines which uh are are generally companies just kind of bragging about their particular technology and they they tell you just enough to sell you but uh, not enough for you to you know, really know what's going on. Um, and uh, I've written a bunch of those in the past. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, so we want to read research papers, right? And uh, so these can come from uh, conferences or journals. Uh, journals tend to be, um, uh, my computer's lagging. I hope my uh, audio is coming across okay. Um, Journals are are uh, are typically peer reviewed, and uh, so that whole process takes a while. Uh, generally, there's a little higher standard uh, to um, uh, submit a paper to a journal, and then there's a lot of uh, review, corrections, uh, resubmissions, that type of thing, and um, so. Uh, they tend to be more reliable and more uh, in-depth and more robust and more comprehensive, I guess, maybe is the best way of saying it. Um, so they're, they tend to be behind, uh, but uh, still still solid stuff. Your conferences, uh, conferences vary anywhere from 
um, being highly selective, uh, like uh, Globecom, for example, in communications is one that's uh, very selective and you, um, you basically have to uh, uh, submit your whole paper um, months in advance and it gets reviewed, uh, maybe not as in depth as a journal article, but it still gets reviewed by other peers and um, uh, you know, acceptance rate is not, you know, hundred percent and um, and all, but uh, then there's other conferences that are um, really trying to encourage the very latest uh, um, of research. And uh, so they will uh, have a much closer uh, due date to the actual conference and you're submitting an abstract. You're not even submitting your whole paper. And uh, in some cases, your papers uh, not even submitted until maybe a few weeks after the conference is completed. So um, uh, those tend to have, a, uh, you know, some great work, very, very recent work, uh, but they also, uh, you know, let some less than great work slip through, right? So, um, all right. So uh, then you also have uh, some tech reports. Uh, these can... Uh, uh, like if you do uh, sponsored research for a government or something like that, a lot of times you'll uh, uh, submit a, a report and sometimes that'll be public. Um, uh, but other times uh, research groups, uh, you know, will uh, we'll have their own uh, submissions and uh, tech reports. Um, and uh, but you kind of have to know where to start. Right. So like uh, for robotics, uh, uh, University of Bonn. Uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, Carnegie Mellon, um, you know, Stanford's always a good one, and, and MIT, and, and that top thing. But uh, yeah, you kind of need to know where to look. And then, uh, you know, I've, I've touched on survey papers a little bit. Uh, there's uh, there's actually uh, IEEE publication that's for surveys. I'm not sure if it's still around, um, uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's really geared for uh, surveys, so. All right, uh, and then more specific ones, uh, depending upon your area of interest. Um, all right, what's in a paper? Uh, if you've started looking at these, you, you've you probably seen common theme, they, they're gonna have an abstract. Well, actually, they're gonna have a title and uh, author information and typically an affiliation where the authors are from. And that's all interesting uh, work, interesting information. Here's going to be an abstract. The abstract should, um, you know, summarize the paper, but also kind of highlight what is new and novel about the paper, right? So you tend to uh, have to be talking about something new in order to get a paper published, right? So uh, the abstract is going to tell you what is novel. And this is where you're uh, really going to initially um, figure out uh, whether you want to invest more time in the paper or not, right? Is if you're going to read that abstract, and um, uh, but it's also going to have an introduction, and then uh, maybe part of that introduction is going to be the motivation. Why do they did the authors think this research is worth doing and writing about, right? And then trying to identify the problem description, and then typically there's a nice statement of the solution, and then there'll be all sorts of details about the solution. Hopefully there's some sort of performance analysis. Is that uh, you know fully analytical? Is it uh, simulation? Is it numerical? Is it experimental? Did they actually build prototypes and that type of thing? And some conclusions, there might be a section on uh, suggestions for future work um, and uh, references and that type of thing. Uh, so how do you read a paper? Uh, well, figure out why you want to read a paper besides completing this assignment because I told you to, right? So, uh, or your uh, thesis advisor told you to or whatever, right? So uh, to know what's going on, right? So, um, you know, actually uh, uh, Twitter, I, I don't use Twitter or X that effectively. Um, but I do have some colleagues, uh, friends that do, and um, 
you know, there's a lot of researchers that will post their stuff uh, there. Uh, I find some stuff on LinkedIn, but yeah, uh, really just occasionally going and, and scanning uh, your uh, journals that are relevant to you and that type of thing. And, and you're just going to uh, kind of uh, pick up on a title, authors, and the abstract, right? And uh, that's that's kind of good to get, get you know general knowledge of what's going on, right? And um, but you know papers in your broad research area, you might you know want to go a little deeper, and um, uh, you know uh, look at some things in a little bit more detail. Note that we're kind of uh, you know looking at the solution description but maybe not all the big body of work in between where they're uh the solution description the summary where they're uh doing proofs or uh derivations and talking about their simulations and all that type of stuff right so uh but papers uh that maybe you want to improve on with your own work or maybe you just want to implement uh, what they uh, talked about in your uh, work. Um, and you're going to read that paper, entire pair, paper very carefully and make notes and highlights and whatnot, right? So uh, what to note, uh, the authors and a research group. Uh, and so after you've read a few of these, you might find that there are certain research groups and even certain authors that are highly regarded in an area. And... Uh, you know, are very uh, uh, prolific um, and, and productive, so, uh, and trustworthy, right? So, um, <clears throat> so you, you should also, and, and this is part of the, the intention of reading a number of papers on the same topic, is you're gonna see some, you know, consistency and in, in themes of the solutions, right? And, um, but yeah, you should be able to kind of pick up on, you know, what is their uh, general approach to the solution? Uh, what's uh, their approach to evaluating that solution, right? How, how good is it? Uh, did they compare it to prior art solutions, uh, other people's solutions? Uh, and uh, you know, how did they actually do this? Uh, how many assumptions did they make? How many simplifying assumptions did they make in their solution, right? And then especially in their evaluation of that. Um, and again, is it analytical, uh, theoretical type thing, or uh, did they do a, a simulation, um, um, maybe a Monte Carlo analysis or something, or uh, did they actually build things, right? And then as you're doing all this, you're kind of keeping, uh, you know, trying to pick up on shortcomings. Um, did they, um, you know, a, a big thing in any sort of research is um, uh, making simplifying assumptions, right? Uh, and, you know, we're often building models and models are a way of uh, understanding the real world, um, but, uh, but we tend to, you know, simplify those so we can understand the real world, right? And, uh, or predict uh, how something's going to work. Uh, but it's it's very difficult uh, and sometimes counterproductive to include every uh, variable in our work, right? So, um, so we make assumptions. Uh, were those assumptions too, too much? Uh, or were they inappropriate? Um, did their, uh, conclusions were they supported by the performance evaluation did the performance evaluation uh realistically and authentically show that their solution has some advantages um this is where you want to be skeptical um and if it sounds too good to be true it often is and when you're writing a paper, uh, he's got a whole nother section now on how to write, and we're not going to cover that. Uh, but feel free to look at that. Um, happy to uh, talk to you, and um, um, or or you know you can talk to your thesis advisor. But you know how do you approach writing things? And uh, you know you, when you reviewed a few papers, and uh, with a little healthy sense of skepticism. 
um, it starts to help you become a better writer also. And you stop uh, saying things like, um, uh, oh, this is exponentially better than the one before, right? So that's that's something a marketing person might say, but an engineer actually would have to look at it and say, is that really an exponential growth uh, curve? Uh, can I fit it to an exponential and actually show it? Or, or can I analyze it and show that that's an exponential uh, type of thing? So we have to be careful when we make uh, assertions about our, uh, our solutions and make sure they're really backed up, right? Um, all right, so let's go back and let's look at this paper here, right? So, uh, you know, I'm seeing some uh, graphs here. So, um, you know, uh, I would want to say, okay, is that from these, um, um, you know, equations that they derived here? Are they uh, just plugged into a software program? Um, yeah, when you're looking at these, a type of uh, structures. You've got a lot of uh, electromagnetic fields uh, around here. There's uh, edge effects, there's mutual coupling effects, mutual inductance, mutual uh, some fringing capacitance, and uh, you see some uh, approximately equal things here. Um, the fields aren't perfectly contained on these conductors. There's some potential loss through the substrate. Uh, how much of those things have they accounted for, right? So here's simulated mutual coupling uh, between these uh, uh, things, right? So uh, did they build anything? Here's simulated there also, right? So um, here they're they're talking a little bit more about uh, substrate, but yeah, uh, a lot of a uh, lot of simulation. So. But here, oh, here's a picture. So they've actually built something, right? And now they have the experimental results. So uh, yay, we've got these. Now we can go back and say, yeah, how well did this uh, compare between measurement and simulation, right? So, um, you know, it's not likely to be perfect uh, or it's not a very challenging area to work in. Um, but uh, I mean, sometimes things work out perfectly, but uh, but not usually. And so, uh, yeah, so you're, you're looking at that. And um, well, here's a real world example. They're uh, uh, looking at uh, the, the range of ability to uh, reflect off of this bottle here. Okay, so the radar is on this bench and here's a bottle there. There's a corner reflector. Now that's a metal structure that's designed to uh, geometrically designed so that when there's energy radiant upon it, uh, uh, you know, at a you know appropriate frequency, it will reflect back and stuff. So uh, used in um, uh, radars and calibration and uh, uh, antenna evaluation and that type of thing. So. Uh, yeah, and then you're going to look through uh, the references. Uh, you know, after you've been in the field for a while, you may recognize that, oh, they probably should have referenced uh, my work that I did and, uh, um, you know, as, as prior art or, or something like that, right? Um, also, you're going to look at that conclusion and try to see, yeah, is that uh, conclusion, does it really summarize the paper and was it, um properly supported by their work okay all right uh any questions there all right so uh uh yeah hopefully again this thing uh should be uh fun you should be able to learn a lot while you're doing it um don't get um you know intimidated by tons and tons of theory, right? And uh, math and equations and that type of thing. Uh, and as you read them, um, maybe don't plow through it rigorously the first time you do it, right? Uh, just kind of breeze over it and then uh, uh, try to try to dig a little bit deeper. The hope is that by the time you've done, you know, these five or ten of these and you're you're done, you should be able to go back and look at that first one that you read and um, 
uh, say, oh, yeah, uh, I understand things a lot better now. All right, so um, let's dive into um, kind of our, our last lecture on um, localization issues. So um, last week, um, and I'm sorry, I would normally try to review things a little bit, um, but I'm going to kind of fly through that, but um, uh, because I'm trying to get caught up here a little bit. But what we're doing here is uh, we're trying to do a state estimation of this process, right? And um, we understand that uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in moving and there's some uncertainty in measuring or sensing uh, where we're at, right? So um, we're trying to uh, estimate the state of the system. And in this case, it's its its pose, right? Which is uh, a word we use, uh, you know, originally came from robotics, but applies in autonomous vehicles also, is that it's its location in one, two, or three dimensions or, or whatever, uh, plus its orientation, right? So for a car that might be uh, uh, latitude and longitude, or it might be an X, Y coordinate relative to the road surface or something. And, um, and it's heading or it's orientation, which, uh, or if we think of that in terms of, uh, pitch roll yaw, that would be yaw, right? So, um, yeah, cars pitch up and pitch down as they go up a hill and go down a hill, but that's, uh, not as important. Um, you may be interested in roll so you don't actually exceed uh, the riding moment of the car and roll it over. Um, uh, but that's, uh, you know, uh, not typically a concern in the state estimation uh, process, uh, you know, associated with navigation and that type of thing, right? So, um, yeah, all these things are, uh, are uh, not uh, perfectly predictable or observable. They got a lot of noise and uh, inaccuracies in them. And so we're dealing with probabilities and in, in uh, these cases, they're, they're conditioned uh, based upon the past and other type of information uh, that we might know, right? So uh, X is our uh, location, present pose. And uh, so that'd be multi-dimensional, uh, 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 vector or uh, uh, array matrix, and um, uh, Z is our observations and U's are our inputs, right? So uh, steering wheel angle, uh, accelerator uh, 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 depression, and that type of thing, right? So we uh, talked about Bayes rule, uh, Markov assumption, we kind of glossed over it a little bit of that, uh, and I went through this math pretty quick, um, but uh, we basically come up with this a belief uh, equation here for a Bayes filter. Um, and this is based upon this uh, observation model uh, and a motion model. And then um, we can kind of break this up uh, to implement it as a prediction step. Uh, and then, uh, so this is uh, given our, uh, uh, that we're going to integrate over all these different uh, potential positions, uh, position, uh, different poses, right? And um, the previous one, and uh, we're going to have a certain belief on each one of those as far as how likely that is to be the truth. And then uh, we're going to uh, uh, multiply that or, or weight that uh, based upon this probability that of uh, moving to this new pose from this pose and that input, right? And um, so we're going to uh, integrate over all those uh, potentials and then um, uh, uh, potential uh, beliefs here. And then uh, then we're going to wait, uh, uh, correct that with this correction step and then this uh, uh, again, a probable probability uh, distribution, and then this eight out here is uh, there is a scale factor to make this belief out here still a uh, probability distribution uh, function, um, so that uh, 
yeah, uh, it satisfies our statistics of, um, you know, integrating to one, uh, if you integrate the density uh, function and stuff. So, all right, uh, then we talked about the Coleman filter um, and how it implements things and talked about how um, uh, it requires Gaussian random variables and that uh, everything is linear in it. Uh, but uh, that's not often the case. And so then we make approximations and basically we're uh, making, using uh, a Taylor series expansion and kind of assuming that uh, things are uh, linear nearby a particular point, right? That if we just truncate all these other terms, then that's gonna be close to linear if we stay close enough to this point, right? And, um, uh so then uh multiple dimensions things get a little bit more complex um uh with jacobians and stuff uh and i just kind of uh toss some formulas out there this is just one particular example uh not that these are particularly uh super important uh uh but uh they're an example of uh, showing you that yeah things get nonlinear uh in in real life a lot of times. And then the incentive common filter is a little bit uh, improved um, version of the extended common filter. All right, so now finally today, uh, how far are we in? Uh, we're 40, uh, 45, 46 minutes into lecture and, and now we're gonna get started. So, um, all right, so particle filter, uh, a new thing. Uh, so if you search particle filter, you'll get all sorts of uh, things to put in your, uh, heating and air conditioning system or in your water system, but um, uh, here we're using this to uh, describe a, another implementation of the Bayes uh, filter that is using uh, lots of uh, different, we call them particles, um, they're um, um, different hypotheses on uh, what we're trying to solve. In this case, our uh, pose of our vehicle or robot or whatever, right? And um, uh, we're gonna use lots and lots of these and evaluate them, uh, hopefully in some sort of parallel computing uh, type of approach. And we're going to uh, iterate in on them. So uh, why would we wanna do this? Well. Uh, if the distribution is not Gaussian or even a parameterized distribution, what do I mean by that? Well, a Gaussian is parameterized by its mean and, and variance, right? So uh, we know that that equation or that um, distribution as we know it, uh, called the normal or Gaussian distribution, uh, is described by this coefficient times an exponential with mean over variance and some squares in there and that type of thing right so we know the form of that equation but uh but you know we have lots of different gaussians uh, depending upon what mean and what uh variance uh we have right so those are our parameters um you have triangle distributions you have a uh, poisson distributions you have exponential distributions and on and on and on and on and on right so um uh so but sometimes we don't have a parameterized distribution. Um, uh, you know, the, the you know, you can get even more sophisticated. You can add in uh, not just mean and variance, but kurtosis or skew or or all sorts of things, right? But um, sometimes it's just so complex that we can't, right? So we're going to have to approach it numerically, right? So, um, so a a particle filter is going to match sensor readings, some sort of sensor readings or measurements to a known map to determine the likely pose, right? So uh, we, right away, we're going to see, well, we need some sensors and we need a map, a priori, right? And, um, uh, and our goal is to determine the likely pose. And we use many points, maybe thousands, or even much more, uh, 
each with probabilities of being correct, right? And then we update that as our Eagle vehicle moves. And uh, this is also known as Monte Carlo localization. If you're familiar with algorithms and studied them, then uh, Monte Carlo is uh, a type uh, describing a, a type of uh, uh, numerically iterative, uh, uh, basically you're running lots and lots and lots of experiments. And uh, yeah, there's some uh, tie-in to uh, gambling, uh, uh, games of chance at um, casinos in Monte Carlo. Uh, so, um, but, uh, okay. So, uh, so here we'll just summarize the high level process. I'm going to have some equations, but really I'm trying to get you, um, understanding of, of the, the process overall. Uh, we're going to see in the areas represented by this map that we're, uh, trying to locate ourselves within. And um, we're going to seed that with many candidate points representing the possible location and orientation. So if we're in two dimensions uh, and we've got uh, X, Y coordinate system and, uh, and an origin, then um, we're going to sprinkle uh, these points or particles all over that area. Um, and, you know, it's it's. Uh, maybe not terribly important to try to overthink it at that point, right? So you just uh, spread them all over there randomly. Also, with uh, varying random orientations, right? So, um, and then we're going to capture a sensor reading. That sensor reading is going to give a result uh, that's uh, based upon uh, the real. Um, uh orientation and location right and um uh so we're gonna get that and then we're gonna compare that sensor reading with what we would expect each point to have provided given its pose right and then we'll somehow assign each a probability of being correct and then we will resample points according to the probabilities. And then we'll repeat and possibly, most likely, updating the location via something like odometry, right? Uh, counting uh, wheel turns and um, or looking at um, uh, accelerometer or something like that, right? So um, we'll, uh, we'll update its uh, uh, pose, uh, location, and orientation, right? And then we'll keep repeating this. Uh, so there's some some key things here is that um, our update uh, is uh, our, our moving uh, of the uh, location or pose is going to be accompanied with some uncertainty, right? Some uh, uh, wheels might slip or you might... Uh, uh, try to ramp up speed really fast, but it takes a little while, you know, and so you're uh, you're not moving as quite as far as what you might have predicted or something like that, right? And our measurements have some uncertainty to them also and stuff. And uh, uh, so we need to understand those, uh, understand these uh, probabilities, and then um, also kind of... Uh, this here, this resampling points. There's uh, there's a lot to unpack there. So, uh, so the key is to resample according to the assigned probabilities, and uh, gradually, only the points best matching the sensor reading survive this uh, resampling. Okay, so um, uh, dig into a lot of those statements uh, here in a moment. So let's start with a map. And now let's populate it with a bunch of uh, points. Um, I, I uh, think later on I, I tried to include some orientations uh, on these, but uh, uh, this is actually kind of a floor plan of, of the house I'm in right now, my little country house and, and stuff, recruit. But uh, uh, I'm right here right now. Uh, but I don't have a sensor, otherwise I'd do this in, in real life. So, um, all right, so 
we're going to make a measurement. Uh, so here's uh, our uh, Ego vehicle, uh, our Roomba robot uh, vacuum cleaner or whatever. Uh, so maybe it's got a LiDAR on it. Uh, that'd be an expensive vacuum cleaner or a millimeter wave uh, radar or sonar or something, right? But uh, we've got some sort of uh, way of measuring our environment. And here we're going to uh, assume that it can measure, you know, a certain, um, uh, you know, uh, angle, but in, in one direction, it's, it's mostly um, measuring distance, right? And um, uh, so these are going to be different measurement points. Maybe we shown our, our laser from our LADAR, LIDAR, um, here and then here and then here and then here and we we quickly gathered up those uh, measurements and uh, these are what we call uh, are going to form what we call a point cloud okay but actually measurements are noisy so uh, that's might be what we actually get okay and um, then uh, so now um, we start trying to match that up with what we might expect to see, right? So, yeah, if, if the, uh, uh, the little Roomba is right here, then, yeah, that might make sense. It's kind of flat. Uh, that's a flat uh, wall there in my kitchen, uh, but it could be in the fireplace room or it could be off in the guest bedroom or in the living room. Um, oh. Don't forget about rotating our pose, our, our orientation also, right? So, uh, and then, yeah, a um, uh, bunch along that wall. Uh, oh, in reality, you know, there's uh, not just these nice widely spaced ones, but, uh, but pretty narrowly spaced ones, right? So what we're doing here is we're really looking at each one of these points and trying to decide, hey, does that sensor match? Well, maybe it doesn't in this case, right? We're kind of too close to the wall there. It, uh, you know, we we wouldn't expect that uh, type of um, uh, response there. So, um, all right. So now we have resampled this, and uh, so there's well, there's a lot here. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to look at all these nodes, all, all these particles, and we're going to decide, hey, does that um, measurement match up? And we're going to assign it some probability that it does match, right? So uh, maybe this one uh, is a very low probability, so is this one. Uh, but uh, the one here is a high probability. That's a high probability. So um, all these different uh, uh, particles are going to get a weight associated with them, right? So this is going to be a really low number. These are all going to be pretty high numbers, right? And um, uh, then we're going to kind of resample it such that now we're um, uh, here we might be uh, weighting it with a numerical value against that single particle that's right there. But uh, then that could also be represented by um, multiple different particles um, in that same area right that all have the same weight okay and so now what we've seen is that well we don't have very many particles out here and here and here actually we have none um but uh but we probably have you know just a, a tiny few in these locations where it doesn't match up very well right and uh but then we'll have lots of particles in these other areas right and, um, uh, but yeah, actually we should have some uncertainty associated with that 
also, right? Because that's that's not very realistic, is it, right? Because we still know we have lots of uncertainty in the system. And if we then uh, restrict ourselves to this kind of idealized look, we, in reality, we might be uh, right here and, and looking this direction or, or this direction or something, right? And um, uh, so if we don't have a particle there, we're and we're always using this idealized approach, we're gonna miss that. We're not gonna converge properly, right? So given that we have some, you know, still a lot of uncertainty in our measurements also, then uh, we want to uh, try to approximate that uh, distribution function when we resample it also. So we're resampling with uncertainty. We're not, um, uh, we're, we're drawing from a probability distribution uh, in in doing so. And if you uh, look deeper at particle filters and um, your your own you know research and your project or your uh, reviews, then uh, you're going to find that there's there's uh, a lot of a lot of interesting things going on here with uh, uh, how we uh, uh, draw our samples from an unknown or a um, non-parameterized distribution function, right? And uh, so that's not a, not a trivial process. Uh, um, and, um, but there are some uh, approximate ways of, of doing that and that folds neatly into uh this overall algorithm all right so now unless we are lucky enough to observe a unique region of a complex area we might only have reduced the number of places we might be right so in this first iteration we still have lots and lots of uh, potential locations right now if we'd been in you know, maybe a very complex area of this. Uh, if I, you know, kind of drawn in all the details in this bathroom right here, and and um, uh, you you kind of took a view of that, maybe you could converge really quickly. But uh, here, the idea is that well, we often have kind of plain features here, and so we still have lots of degrees of freedom of where we might actually be. So. Um, how do we resolve that? If we if we just kept repeating that process, uh, you know, we we are not going to be able to say, oh, we're here versus there, right? We're not going to get much more certainty. So uh, our solution is to move around and explore the area, and uh, we use uh, dead reckoning or or a demetry to keep track of our path, what we predict our path to be. So we're a, a Roomba uh, robot. Um, maybe we're going to move a little bit and maybe change our orientation as we do that and uh, then take another measurement, right? So we're going to give it uh, the wheels, some motors, some control inputs to move in a certain path. Um, and um, that movement's not going to be perfectly accurate, but so we'll have a probability distribution associated with that. Um, but uh, we're going to remember all our prior measurements, kind of. Um, uh, that would be, you know, hugely memory intensive if we remembered everything. Um, but uh, yeah, there's uh, a way we do that by evolving the points that we're uh, uh, choosing to retain and update uh, the particles. So we use all of this to estimate our state in a dynamic situation, right? So you'll notice up here in my title, I've, I've kind of updated the state of estimation to dynamic state estimation, right? So we're going to be moving around. And so when we first start off, we, you know, wow, we've got lots of uncertainty. We don't know exactly where we are. So um, we're going to move a little bit and move a little bit and move a little bit and keep repeating all this process each time. And as we do that, then we're uh, going to 
uh, find that, um, uh, you know, as we uh, resample and, and do this matching and then resampling, that will uh, our particles will converge more and more into a particular area. So, um, all right. So, yeah, we're we're going to move our vehicle in this maze position. Then we move all the particles in the same way. Right, but uh, probabilistically, so we're going to incorporate some errors due to imperfect movement. So again, we're going to draw from a motion model, and um, uh, that's going to be a probabilistic motion model. And we might uh, kind of look at our system and say, uh, "What's what is uh, that?" um likelihood or what is that a uh, probabilistic model right and um um uh so there's uh kind of a disciplined way of of looking at that if uh you know you're um uh moving according to a demetry and, and counting wheel uh slips uh wheel uh revolutions then you can um uh kind of imagine some errors and then come up with a, a model that is associated uh, with those errors. And uh, it might be simple, it might be more complex. Um, and then we take a new measurement, right? This measurement also, uh, uh, when we apply it to these things, oh, I have a spelling error there. Um, uh, there's some uncertainty there, so we have, uh, this is when we take a new measurement, uh, that's our observation model. And, um, oh, well, I've got two dogs in the house, right? So what happens if uh, a dog or myself or whoever walks in front of that uh, robot while it's taking a measurement, right? So you're going to suddenly get uh, some weird uh, results, right? Uh, or what happens if um the uh sensor has finite range like a, a sonar sensor doesn't have very far range right so um and uh so you get a max distance uh result um where it's it's at max range or there's just noise in it right so you build up this uh observation model also then you reweight and resample these particles according to how well they match the measurement. Okay? So by resampling the particles after each step according to their weight, which has been assigned according to how well they match the measurement, the particles will eventually cluster around the true pose. Okay? And uh, so, yeah, we need to figure out how to sample from a complex non-parametric distribution that represents the pose probability uh, after movement and eventually the track that it's taken. Uh, and also, uh, you know, probably should have added this also is that we need to do that same thing for the observation or measurement of uh, probability. And uh, so if we, uh, there, there's when you read the literature on these things, you'll see that there's uh, some kind of classic uh, mobility um, models and some classic observation models, and um, uh, there are trade-offs in terms of uh, computational complexity versus fidelity and and that type of thing. Right. So. Um, all right, so you know, how would you even you know start to set this up? Um, I don't think I, I'm going to go into a ton of stuff here, but uh, here we have our um, uh, uh, set of J samples with their weights. Okay, and uh, I'm going to go back and change those to Ws, but they're sometimes omega, sometimes Ws, uh, and so this forms a set, right? So um, and again, note that uh, this 
xj is the state of each particle in our application we're looking at the location orientation of the pose and that might be in 1d 2d or 3d right so uh last week at the end of the lecture i talked about uh this video um and hopefully you got a chance to watch that that's linked uh in the moodle um and there it uh, uh is a 1d uh type uh, uh, approach. And it um, uh, looks at, a, I think it's a plane altimeter uh, that's uh, trying, you know, planes trying to fly at a constant altitude, um, but then imaging uh, or sensing the altitude above the ground, right? So um, uh, so it's, it's flying above uh, um, you know, trying to trace out the um, um, the terrain underneath, right? And it goes through kind of a hilly mountainous valley area, you know, mountain divide, and uh, lots of uh, peaks and valleys, and that sort of thing. And then it goes over uh, a, a lake or a river or something like that, right? Where it's all flat, and then uh, back to uh, some more complexity, and what you see is that when you have a very diverse environment, uh, uh, it's easier to match things up. If you are flying over a lake and you're just, or the ocean, and you're just uh, pinging that uh, uh, altitude, then you're basically going to see flatness, right? And it's all going to look the same, um, you know, ignoring some waves and whatnot. So, um, um, so that was kind of a nice example of a one-dimensional uh, type of uh, particle filtering application. Um, so if, if you didn't get a chance to watch that, I, I strongly uh, suggest doing that. It probably is going to explain this a whole lot better than I do. Um, right, so then W's, WJs are our corresponding weight. Now they should all, uh, you know, sum to one. Right, so this is uh, represents a probability. Uh, so the samples represent the belief or posterior. Uh, here, p of x uh, equals this summation uh, over these weights, and now here we're going to use this Dirac or delta function here, uh, where <laughs> this is going to. Uh, produce a, a value uh, of one or that will integrate to one um, at the centroid of where this particle is at, right, for for all of X, right? And uh, so what we're doing is we're saying, okay, at this <laughs> location, um, oh, we should take a break here soon. Uh, uh, excuse me. Um, so uh, we're going to have a bunch of these Dirac functions, and they're all going to be scaled by this uh, weight. But when you sum them, it's all going to equal one. And uh, but that's going to vary over uh, uh, the x. Um, uh, okay. So um, and again, x is possibly multidimensional. So uh, here in uh, so. Uh, what I just described, particle uh, filtering, is possibly more generic than you know just applying to localization. But now, if we uh, we we've talked about it in terms of localization, but uh, it it's actually a, a very generalized uh, uh, technique. And um, but uh, we can use it for localization, and it's often called Monte Carlo localization. Here, every particle is a pose hypothesis, right? So uh, it is holding, uh, it's, it's representing a, a hypothesis that, hey, I'm the correct one, right? I am, uh, you know, me, my little particle here, I am the correct one, right? And uh, everyone, uh, you know, every particle has that uh, belief uh, or that it's a, uh, it's a hypothesis that is to uh, system 
to try to figure out which of those hypotheses are uh, truly supported. You know, hopefully we get down to just uh, one or, or a tight cluster of them, right? And uh, so the proposal is the motion model, right? So I'm going to put this back in terms of that Bayes uh, filter, Bayes model, right? And um, here, so we have this uh, motion model uh, where we had the previous location where we thought we were, okay, and uh, control inputs to move and um, translated into, um, you know, um, inputs that make sense for this, right? And then uh, that's your condition part. And then this thing's going to represent the probability uh, that X uh, or current levels. Uh, is uh, the result of those elements, right? And that being a uh, probability, we're going to draw sample from this distribution, right? And that's going to become our uh, new new particle, right? Uh, with its with its pose hypothesis, and we're going to do that a whole bunch of times. And then uh, we're going to correct that using our observation model, right? So uh, here, uh, I'm kind of skipping over some hand-waving some stuff here, but um, let's again look at um, our observation model. We have our uh, current position plus the, the measurement uh, or the map, I'm sorry, the map. And uh, what is the likelihood that the observation is a result of those, right? So uh, what's what's the likelihood that that uh, measurement or observation is a result of the particle having this pose in the context of this map, right? And uh, we're going to map that to our weights. And uh, here are this. Uh, Target versus uh, proposal is um, a little bit of the idea that I'm, I'm just kind of uh, decided to skip over for the sake of time. But it's the idea that um, um, we're going to uh, uh, update our uh, proposal uh, by this uh, target um and this really has to do with uh the inability to easily sample draw a sample from a uh non-parameterized complex probability distribution uh function and so uh so maybe maybe kind of ignore that i'm sorry um again if you want to dive deeper into this i can um uh give you guidance on that but um just trying to save some uh time and uh realizing that we didn't talk a lot about that sampling process so anyway all right uh each particle evaluates the likelihood of the given observation given their pose, right? So, and then we just update that, right? So that's uh, the same type of process as the um, um, uh, Bayes filter and the Coleman filter, right? We're uh, using that kind of same uh, uh, update and observation uh, correction uh, type of approach and iterate that. And um, uh, so as we do that, eventually all these particles should uh, begin to cluster. And um, yeah, all right. So let's uh, take a short break tonight. Um, and uh, then I'll just have a couple more slides on uh, localization. And uh, with the SLAM type stuff, uh, going to cover that at even more of a high level than a particle filter, and um, uh, then we'll move on and talk about uh, sensors. Uh, again, um, you know, 
you if you see anything here that uh boy i really wish we could have dived deeper in the slam i kind of heard about that it kind of sounds fascinating or you know i'd like to do more with particle filters i've used uh particle filters for um uh, a number of different applications there's uh, 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 a lot of issues with uh, in the defense sector on relying on GPS uh, it's considered unreliable in modern complex because uh, it's so easily jammed and, um, and and harder to but still can be spooked and so there's things like uh, navigating via uh, uh, magnetic anomalies uh, that are mapped around the world and uh, where uh, you can sense the local magnetic field and you can uh, use a particle filter to fit that. Um, uh, you can do navigation on the ocean uh, by uh, bathymetric measurements or, or looking at um, uh, the depth of the ocean using a uh, depth sonder. And um, if you have a map of that, then you can uh, again, uh, localize yourself with that also. Uh, the cool thing to, to back up with the magnetic anomalies is there's no really known way of jamming uh, magnetic fields uh, at scale, at distance, right? So um, it's kind of a, a jam-proof uh, type of uh, approach. It's maybe not uh, going to give you super precision, but um, so um, certainly things that uh, I can point you to uh, if you want to do, uh, you know, pivot your project into something like that. Um, and also uh, some very relevant, uh, interesting things. All right, so uh, enough of me rambling. Uh, let's take a uh, five minute break. I've got uh, 7.52 right now. So let's come back at 7.57 Eastern time.